you've never been to the Situation Room, but uh, for everybody who comes, we welcome them with a proverb where CT makes his travels. And this time around, he's making his travels around the continent with Echo Bank. Mm, the Pan-African Bank. Mm. And we're in the country of Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. A very interesting country with a very rich, rich, rich history. God is good, but never dance with a lion. That is the proverb. Okay. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, how I translate it? Yes. Ah, please. Yes, okay, yes, what what does it mean? Okay. I believe what you mean is that as much as God is there for us and to take care of us, we shouldn't test Him and go into danger zone expecting Him to save us. Yeah. And you said it so. Thou well. shalt not test the Lord thy God. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or thou shall interpret Proverbs correctly. I mean, a thousand points to you. Do with them whatever you please. <laughs> they are redeemable. Acts. Yes, yes. They are redeemable and standard group. Situation group. Situation no group. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, as we're getting into this, usually it's... Okay, that's a lie. In December, we'll be there planning for the new year, right? No, you're not. You're using whatever it is that you have enjoying the festivities. Yes. Then the reality of the day knocks you in the side of the head in January. And you're like, oh, wow. Okay, so certain things need to be done. And I didn't quite do that. So, and that's why we premised it with, we're still saying Happy New Year. Oh, by the way, Happy New Year, Linda. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Happy New Year right. to you. So, even as we get into that and we're saying, okay, we can still plan. Can we get into uh, where we're planning our finances in the new year? And I guess starting it off, Linda, is it too late to think about what you would plan for this year, even as we get into this conversation? Is it too late? Um, it's never too late to start financial planning. Uh, also, never consider January being the key of the start of financial planning. Oh, You could even start in November, I mean. You could start in September. The main issue in starting to financially plan is the starting point. Know where you're starting and why you're starting. That is the main impo important thing. So go ahead, start now, do your planning. You are way, way in order right now, regardless of your age, regardless of your status, regardless of your employment status, you're fine. Hmm. Why is financial yes. planning important? Why is it important? Yes. Uh, there's a study that came out recently, which was on the uh, one of the local newspapers that stated that Kenyans are amongst the poorest retirees glo globally. Mm which means that we as kenyans are not planning to retire mm. that's the first step and that all comes into financial planning where have you been putting your money while employed how are you going to survive upon not having a steady income upon retirement so i believe that is the most important one it's retirement planning two uh medical we have a very big issue of medical planning insurance per se in kenya whereby you find all kenyans are one medical issue away from poverty we have experienced this. We have gone through our many WhatsApp groups of coming in together to money to pay mm -hmm. uh, expenses, medical expenses. So that is another major issue why people should financially plan. And three, just to be comfortable, to be able to afford the good things in life, to be able to live not thinking about tomorrow, to be debt free. Those are all reasons why someone should be able to financially plan. I want to ask a question. Yes, sir. If we're talking about the employment sector in its totality, yes. where would you say the bulk of the people are employed in? Uh, bulk of the people would be employed in corporate. No. Nope. Really? It is. In the formal. In, oh, that is. Yes. Okay, in formal sector. And then next, government. Government, yes, civil servants are very many yes, in the, then in the Kenya, sector and now the corporate. Is third. Yes. So, let's start with something a little more formal like the government yes so who plans for the retirement of these people you are working in a government it has a structure yes they come up with super enumerated fund they come up with god knows what fund <laughs> they <laughs> okay let's go with that for yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they come up with all these SHIF. things yes yeah. then they even tell you they've got a retirement benefits authority yes and if you work for the government before some of these changes were made you told the government has a pension scheme you know they deduct this and then they add you this all these things okay mm. and since it's deducted the money is nestled somewhere yes. and all that is very good until you retire <laughs> then you can't access your money it's not that the money isn't there you can't access it and then over time it's 
the amount may seem like it's reasonable, yeah. but over time and inflation is like someone didn't think of this and it is happening. And it's the government who makes these policies. Yeah. You suddenly find you've got some 3,000 shillings you're supposed to survive on. Mm. And the, any rural area, by and large, by definition, is a hardship area. Mm. Yeah. And you've been working in town all your life, people expect that you have means. So all I'm saying is, when we talk of planning and that study you spoke of, did they take all these things into consideration? Yes. I didn't want to go into the informal sector because now that is a completely different discussion. Yeah. So, here we are. I'm a government employee. I have retired. Yes. And if you look at me very carefully, I look like somebody who should have retired. Yes. Okay. Now, what do I do when I can't access my money? So, uh, the government retirement plan is, uh, has been changing over the years. Mm. Uh, previously, they used to have a scheme called a defined benefit scheme. Yes. Whereby, upon retirement, you would be paid based on your position when you retired, how much you were earning. It would be determined by professionals called actuaries. So, they would decide this person is going to be paid this much when they retire. However, over the years, the government has been trying to change this to move into defined contribution schemes whereby even the civil servants are contributing towards their own retirement. Yes. That is how the public service superannuation scheme came about, whereby they want the civil servants to also contribute to their retirement. Uh, as they're saving for this, not only do they have the assurance that this money will be there, because remember before in the defined benefit scheme, it was money that will be created, where, will be provided when you retire. Mm. But when you're contributing, this money is placed with a fund manager. This fund manager invests the money and it exists. It's with a third party. So with that in mind, knowing that this money actually exists, it's even easier now for government employees, once they're contributing, to know that I have something when I retire. The previous one might have not really been helpful for them. I'm not very sure if at all uh they are benefiting from it or they're being paid but i believe most government employees who re retired way back are still on government pension and are paid monthly but the new one they will be paid you know um i am really sitting here and i'm thinking of the average kenyan listening to us okay whatever salary they make or profit they make over the last one year or two due to inflation and taxes their income has reduced in that income, they're supposed to somehow save, plan for retirement, uh, and be able to meet their needs. So I'm asking myself, and I'll give you two scenarios. I'll give you the scenario of someone who earns 500,000, who lost around 40% of his <laughs> money or, uh, due to taxes. Uh, central bank has in increased the lending rate by 2%, so his car is now more expensive to pay back on, so is his mortgage. And then the other side, someone who's earning 30,000 shillings a month and can't make ends meet. How do you plan? You know, how, how, how do you plan? <laughs> um, it's hard going from a specific reliable income that you are used to mm -hmm. to going to less. It is definitely hard and we are all going to experience this. However, that is when budgeting comes in. Mm. That's where goal setting comes in. I do not believe uh, financial planning is based on your income. Mm -hmm. It's based on a decision that you make. You will find someone who's earning a salary of 10,000 Kenya shillings has saved more than someone earning 100,000 Kenya shillings. <laughs> True. It's not about how much you're earning. Yes, I could be earning 100,000 today, and my net is probably 60,000, and then tomorrow is 50,000. Mm. I have no other decision but to plan around that. I don't have, what can I do with that? Look for extra sources of income. Mm. That is an, uh, one option. Mm. I always tell people who are employed, and I hope no HRs are, are tuned in right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Announcement and some yeah. HR <laughs> practitioners, please yeah. log yeah. off now. <laughs> that uh, always look for an alternative source of income while you're still employed. Mm. Do not depend on one single income. Mm. And don't also take a big risk in that alternative source of income. So majorly, all you have to do is look for other ways of income to substitute probably that 10,000, that 20,000 that is now going into the health fund. Those are ways to look around it. Okay. Yeah. So what... Um, are some things then that ought to be prioritized uh, when it comes to financial planning? Okay. Uh, the first one and foremost is budgeting. Mm. You need to have a budget. Without a budget, you're basically not directing your money to where to go. A budget tells you this one should go here, this one should go there. And also, saving and investing. 
those are two very critical things you need to have an emergency fund at whatever age you are in life you need to have a minimum three to six month emergency fund three to six months of what your, your basic expenses what you spend every month okay. mm -hmm. is it your basic needs is it your wants mm. is it your leisure anything is it education is it medicine any medical covers anything you do in a month you just pro see how much you spend in a month and make sure you've saved that mm. and this investment has to be very liquid something that you can easily get access to in case you are retrenched, in case you lose your job, in case something happens to you. It's not money you you've money. tied up in a fund or that they will tell you you need to, something, how no. many days to get it out. No, when you're investing, you need to be very clear on your goals. Am I, do I, am I looking for liquidity? Am I looking to lock my money? Maybe it's for future use. Maybe I want to pay my kids education when they go to university. Am I looking for money that I want in six months? That determines where you invest your money. So most people, maybe emergency funds, they look into money market funds or unit trust funds. Where, you know, if I put my money today, I can get it back when I request for it. Okay. Yeah. You've talked about savings. One yeah. thing that, I mean, a lot of people struggle with. So how then do you put savings away when you're barely making it? And that's, it's not being playing the victim it's not saying oh please woe unto me it's that you're not able to make ends meet and here is the clarion call to save save what so how i tackle savings is savings should be part of your expenses do not save what is left but spend after you've saved so if at all i'm paying rent and i'm paying uh, my usual subscriptions for every month Savings should be part of that. I know I'll send 2000 to this investment. I know I'll save this much into my retirement uh, scheme. Maybe I'm in a pension scheme. I know I'll do this. That should be part of your expenses that should not miss in your budget. Mm. It shouldn't be, I've, I've spent my money in all this. I've been left with this amount. Now let me save that. No, that wouldn't work because you'll never have anything left in that scenario. What about the guys who over the last one year had that three to six months saved and it's all burnt up and your little kibanda in town, you're shutting it down because taxes are a bit high. W what do you do then? We have How do you pull yourself after? Unfortunately, we have to appreciate that there are risks that come with any form of investment. Mm -hmm. There are risks and mistakes that come about with everything that you look at in any way. In that, I ca we cannot predict your business failing but you as a business owner you can see the potential risks that are coming through it maybe it's operational risks that you haven't looked at maybe you have people this fraud in your company just mismanagement anything those are things that will happen not everyone can be lucky <laughs> not lucky can be okay without financial uh with financial freedom so in such a situation whereby i had saved for six months within those six months it was my honors to look for something to do it was for me to wake up, get up, and look for a way to earn income because I know I have this spread to support me only up to six months. So we shouldn't also be lazy. It's an interesting pronunciation of lazy. When it comes to that. <laughs> okay, so yeah. uh, one area um, when we think about that is in investing because that's the other thing that you spoke about, saving and then investing women specifically are not quite you know the men's clubs and they were going to invest here buy this buy that women have um a lot more of the chamas yeah. right the groups so how would you say that you can use that which you have you know as women to save or to invest rather okay i would put it this way uh men are more risk taking mm -hmm. than women <laughs> men can sit down today of a glass of water and decide we are going to invest in this mm -hmm. and they'll all <laughs> contribute their money by tomorrow and they do it women are very uh reserved when it comes to risk we're looking at it from maria we're not looking at it what will it do for me for two months i think at the five years ten years mm. i'm looking at how about my children will they be okay how will it happen to my family in case my spouse loses their job we think way ahead rather than men so for women their best investments are always, you, you can always direct them to very safe investments. Things that they know my principal is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Things that they know I have a return that will beat inflation. Those are the kind of setups for women. Men will <laughs> go crazy on any investment that is out there that they see will give them a return mm. without even analyzing. Sorry. 
<laughs> <laughs> Don't make apologies. <laughs> Without Shelly. So what's the preferred route? Yes. Um I think a mix of both is important. Okay. You need to take risk, of course based on your age, but also you need to also be a bit preservative. <laughs> <laughs> you need to know um, at this point of my life how, how much percentage of my portfolio can be in risk mm. and how much can be safe. But if you're not a risk taker, don't. Just be safe. Mm. Yeah, that you don't have to do something because it's working for another person. Tied to that is the conversation about whose money is whose. <laughs> because we talked about, you know, you're in a family setting, maybe women are more concerned about you know their children and this uh men will go on the fly and say okay well this will give me returns real quick let's go whose money is whose when you come together as a unit well i know the normal belief is uh the man's money is our money and my money is my money huh? but i have a different perspective when it comes to fa planning family money mm. what i've realized is uh uh just from the small statistic i've done with my clients and the likes you'll realize that uh, men are struggling in debt whereas their spouses or their partners actually have savings so the partner is the the wife so to speak or the lady in the relationship he's investing for longer term and not thinking about the immediate uh structure and then you've been raised knowing that at the end of the day your family is all about you as a woman if anything fails, you are the one who's going to support. So you'll find men will be taking loans to cover things that some women can afford. I always say that women and men should sit, uh, spouses should have, make a budget together. Many people don't reveal what they earn to their spouses uh, for their own reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe you should at least know, your, let your spouse know what you can afford and what you can't. Don't take your school, your kids to schools that you're struggling to pay school fees. Mm. Don't live in an estate where you're struggling to pay rent. Don't have a lifestyle or drive a car that you're struggling to pay for just because you have to maintain a standard for your spouse. These are conversations you should discuss. Tell your better half, I cannot afford this, let's downgrade a bit. So I believe it's a conversation that needs to be had. It's hard, but it's a conversation that needs to be had. What makes it hard? Uh, one, our African setup of how we were raised, that uh, the provider is the man. Mm. So regardless has, of whether... Has, uh, has that changed? Huh? <laughs> has that changed? Has that changed? A lot has changed. And you'll f But the problem is the man will still be providing regardless of the woman earning more than the man. You, know you should seek a career in the diplomatic services. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I do believe it has changed mm. a lot. Mm. Yes, women are do uh, some. Most women are doing better in relationships, especially when you look at the corporate setups. When you say better in terms of providing, I was uh, no earning, earning, so earning. earning better than in that sense. They add, they're able to add to the kitty because yes. conversations are hard. Yes. So we're seeing an involve an evolvement rather. Yes. Okay. Of women earning more, mm. but I. Uh, not really spending more. I actually want to ask this question. Is it <laughs> genetic? Is, is it something in your DNA that makes women more careful when it comes to issues of money? Or is it something you learn or is it something you're taught? Uh, it depends, especially if women, for a woman who has kids, your first priority. No, no. Let, me, let me go back to my question yeah. again. When it comes to kids, are women taught? Children play a role yes. in how you end up thinking about money in the future. Yes. But are women taught? Or is it something you observe and you learn over time? Or is it something you're born with and you just have it? You know from the time you're one year old that you must join a jama. And you <laughs> 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 we observe. I think mostly it's observation. Especially when you talk about chamas. Growing up, most of our mothers were in uh, chamas. Nowadays, actually, men are in chamas as well. And they don't like it being called chamas, but they are in chamas as well. <laughs> and uh, we grew up seeing them. We grew up seeing the merry-go-rounds, seeing them receiving money, and all that. And also them planning even for the family. You'd find growing up, most of their fathers would leave the financial part to their mother, giving them the money to be able to plan for the family. Mm -hmm. So growing up seeing that, as so, as most women have grown up knowing that this is how I'm supposed to do, I'm supposed to take care of my family, I'm supposed to do this. So I believe, yes, it's something about observing and growing up in that situation that shows you this is how you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Mark has a question. Yes. Yes. 
uh, the chipmunk mouth is open now. There we go. <laughs> Chew, Mark. Uh, Chew. Yes. <laughs> we, 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 we've talked about savings and investments and, and budgeting. Mm. How much of your budget should be dedicated to leisure? Okay. Because it always seems such a serious conversation. Like, talk about the school fees, the loans, and the savings. Leisure, how much should we spend? Oh, there's something called the 50 30 20 rule. Okay. I'm sure you've heard about it, whereby they say that the 50 mm. should go to your needs. Mm. And remember when we were younger, we were taught basic needs of what? Food, shelter, shelter and clothing. clothing. Mm -hmm. But that has increased nowadays. Now, education is part of needs. Now, <laughs> not internet yet. <laughs> now, insurance is part of needs. So, that is in the 50. Mm -hmm. The 30 should absolutely go to leisure, in my view. Mm -hmm. And by leisure, I just don't mean uh, those are the, where the internet's come in. That is where traveling comes in. That internet is where. Is yes, it is. Wow. Some of us that is where. Uh, <laughs> <internet>. uh -huh. <laughs> that is where traveling comes in. That is where doing your hair buying clothes all those nice things you want that is where it comes in mm -hmm. and then now the 20 is supposed to be for savings and investments mm -hmm. so okay. that is where that money should be so now with the 30 percent also consider you've gotten this new thing that we've gotten where you contribute to things mm -hmm. it's something i've something to your friend a fin roller or what we always contribute to things also that has been added into now that uh 50 that we put as needs okay yes so the question here is how as kenyans are we trying to get rid of this conversation of always coming up with money to help people mm. in need mm. so i believe that is a bigger conversation that we need to have okay yeah. and so that borrowing is thrown into this as well yeah um and there's always a conversation so if you're borrowing from a financial institution bank whatever it may be what should you borrow for because it's all part of the plan yeah what should you borrow for you should borrow for something that will give you a return that is going to make sense based on what you're paying back mm. for that loan the unfortunate part of it is that we borrow for things like uh, that are liabilities I could borrow to buy a car but it's my personal usage mm. that's a liability because I'm spending on this car I'm servicing the loan unless the car makes sense based on what I do in terms of my job it is uh, helping with the convenience because also you cannot put a price on convenience you can. <laughs> you can. You can. Yeah. Just like you can put a price on peace of mind. Yeah. Yes. You actually can. So I, I, I strongly believe that it is okay to own a car if it's a liability based on how it's servicing you. So if I take a loan to buy a car and I'm paying back this much, does it make sense considering if I was, let's say, operating, if my job I was operating by Ubers or I was operating by uh, public transport of any other kind? So also, take a loan knowing it's going to it might not be immediate gratitude i might take a loan for educational purposes i might take a loan to educate myself further mm -hmm. i might take a loan uh to buy a house i might take a mortgage but there'll be a return sorry do you count that as having some kind of return no it doesn't have no. a return but am i saving on rent am i covering this loan payment by how much I would have paid for rent if I hadn't taken this mortgage. Oh. That is how you would uh, look at it. On, on that mortgage, I've, I've, I've tried to do the math on rent versus mortgage, and it has never balanced out. There are, unfortunately, or mortgage does not really, is not really set out. The interest rates in our country are very, very high. Yes. So it might not make, it depends on your reason why, but I don't think... <laughs> Well, <laughs> that math, any mortgage above 15 yes. percent compared to equivalent in rent in over 25 years, you yes. will save more money renting in this country than getting a mortgage. The only mortgage that can make sense is anything below eight to nine percent in this country, if you can get it. Absolutely. I think a mortgage makes sense if you work for maybe an employer who's giving you a staff benefit yeah. that gives you a low rate. Mm. Other than that, uh, let's let's stick to rent. Mm. Yeah. Wow, you made yeah. one of the first persons who said that. No, but it's true. Mm. You do the mathematics, anything above fifteen percent over twenty five years being paid back, you will pay back one and a half times the cost of the unit and you will have saved uh, more than twice the rate by simply paying rent and having the flexibility of not having your finances 
tied to a building that is not making you any money you pay government rates on it mm -hmm. and if you default anytime within those 25 oh. years uh, you, that <laughs> yeah. banker who was smiling at you will hang you just that's the lion you should not be dancing with in fact <laughs> <laughs> yes. proverb 2.0 yes. okay so i mean there's something you mentioned earlier about women and how they are what did you say? I think it was more careful, yes. not as risk. Um, they are risk averse. Uh, yeah, they're yeah. risk averse. So then what would be some lessons that women need to learn then when it comes to um, um, finances? What are, When it comes to investments, when it comes to savings, what are some lessons that they should be wary of, even even when we say women are risk averse? Yeah. Uh, the one thing they need to be is our, our, uh, insurance. I think it's very important for people to get insurance covers mm. and also to understand what the purpose of insurance is. Uh, most people take insurance as an investment, of which it's not. You should be able to have insurance and investments, both of them mm -hmm. in your portfolio. The insurance cover is supposed to help you in a situation, to protect you, to get you back to where you were before the situation, not give you a benefit mm -hmm. per se. Mm -hmm. So get insurance covers. Uh, get covers for your children if you have any. Get funeral covers for your parents who are aging. Get such things to be able to support you in the future. Another thing I believe women should also do is get a bit more risky. You will find most charmers uh, with women, the first thing they'll always do is let's buy land. Mm. Not that they've seen that it's performing well or not that there's a history of it doing well. It's just that they feel like it's safe to know I have this piece of property here and it's mine. I want to see, I have a title deed, this shows me that it's mine. However, I believe investing in the financial sector is more lucrative right now in the, in the current times that we are in, mm. rather than holding something. Okay, now think about somebody going into a business because that's what, another thing that you've spoken about. You're starting a business alongside its moonlighting, whatever it may be, <laughs> and uh, when you're talking about money that you're going to put in financial capital it's almost close to impossible to have a startup without that need for yeah. financial input what would you advise because you know you're not sure of what's going to happen but you said if you're going to borrow borrow on something that's going to give you returns, returns. Yes. so you'll find nowadays borrowing it's not very easy if you don't have a pay slip mm. if you want to borrow from a financial services uh, let's say a bank they normally tie most of the things to pay slips or an asset that you own. I would say if you're planning to start a business, if one, if you're employed, start it then or save towards it then. You already know what you want to do. And this is your budget. Set a realistic goal that in five years I'm going to start this business fully and enter it fully. But for now, within year one to five, what, this, what steps have I taken mm -hmm. to make this business start? It can be a shell for now with someone running it as you're employed and gaining that money. You might use your employment then to take a loan to support this business that you're planning to do. Then once you're ready, leave your employment and go now run it fully. But do not step out today and go start running a business with your emergency fund. Mm. That, that uh, most of the time doesn't work. We have example of retirees who leave uh, employment, they're given their pension money, and they go do what others did because it worked for them. They'll go buy a matatu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They'll go buy a piece of land just like that and then you don't have liquidity you don't have income you don't have anything because they've decided to venture into a business immediately you left employment without research without having experienced it before if you're employed and you get into a business if you fail you still have the backup of your salary to support okay. you mm -hmm. yeah you see the many countries who have developed i like giving japan as an example because it's one of those few countries that has more money to invest and it actually knows what to do with mm -hmm. And I'm not being facetious yeah. because they have a culture of saving. Yeah. Again, probably it's by example. Now, in a country like ours, given the way we are structured and given our communities, at least some communities that we... Well, I guess we are all similar. It's just more or less of the same. Has the insurance industry ever thought of introducing these wonderful things that they do or the financial institutions have they ever thought of introducing these things into the school curriculum so that as somebody learns they understand that these things are there so the, the idea is in your mind from a very very early age
Yeah. So by the time you start earning money, it does. You don't have to be in formal employment. You may have parents who give you pocket money. You may have money that someone gives you as a gift, so that you actually start thinking. Because many parents who have the the ability to and the means have understood the need for opening account for their children. Yeah. Okay. Now, what about children understanding how to invest that money and how to use it? See, if you set that habit when you're young, yeah. By the time you get into adolescence, you have a fairly clear idea of what to do with money. Yes. By the time you are probably in an employment or you're earning more money, you you will not be starting anything new. Yeah. For the bulk of us, you start this thing of money when you start earning a salary. Hundred percent. So I totally agree with that. That uh, the educational system needs to introduce uh, ways in which kids can learn financial planning, even in high school, leave alone even just university, even as as back as high school. I was, idea, I was thinking primary. Oh <laughs> yes. The idea for the new education system was actually supposed to be in line with that and I hope it's something that will be picked. There's a tweet I read that said, uh, I cannot file my returns, but I know the parts of a flower. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> when you look at it that way, you're like, at what point am I being taught? Mm -hmm. Us as uh, CIC, we do educate uh, educational institutions. We do offer training to institutions uh, to talk to their kids about how they can plan financially. We've had collabs with a couple of uh, schools here and there just to be able to advise the children. But in the long run, it's not sustainable to be doing it as a company. It needs to be introduced in the curriculum in school. A quick one. You, you talked about retirement and you said that uh, Kenyans are the poorest uh, retirees uh, apart from city. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, tongue in cheek, tongue in cheek. <laughs> so, how much sh is enough to retire on? <laughs> First of all, money will never be enough. Yeah. Let's start there. <laughs> Two, you need, they normally say at least this have 60% of your current income as your income when you retire 60 percent 60 percent if i'm earning a hundred thousand as my total inflow net mm -hmm. in a month i should target having sixty thousand as my inflow once i retire because we believe that after retirement you'll be done with the major expenses such as school fees maybe paying rent mm -hmm. uh things that you used to do and spend money on yeah. they'll have reduced drastically then so you should budget towards that and remember we are living longer mm -hmm. nowadays so you have longer years after retirement, almost similar to the number of years you worked for. Mm. So you need to budget for this. You need to budget of 40 years for working and 30 years of retirement, or even 20 years. Mm. So you need to plan for those 20 years, what am I going to do? So the reason why we were even ranked as the poorest is because most people are actually going back seeking jobs, mm. even from their former employers, mm. to seek jobs to be able to run. They are entering into they're not literally they're not relaxing they're not resting they're not retiring comfortably mm. they are working okay. so 60 percent is that question the united states has a similar problem uh, many of the uber drivers and people who are getting into back into employment are retirees yes. and some have argued that for as long as you have strength and health um, in fact some have argued that you'd be actually healthier if you keep if working work, yeah. so instead of me saving 60 percent why don't i change i work for 50 years and retire for 10. you see if i want to work to be healthy i'll walk around my farm i will have <laughs> passive income and go play a game of golf you have, you but have a farm yes. <laughs> a country like the one he, he refers to yes the farm is that house yes, yes. This concept of Gishagi that we have in Kenya, they Does don't have. Okay. That alternative, because we think retirement, we think moving from an urban area it's to a rural area. area. For them, there's that doesn't exist. Yes. So how I'll differentiate that is, me working for health mm. is different to me working for income, to, for basic income. Yes, it's it's bad to sit around doing nothing, mm. especially all the older you are. However. If I'm working for my health, I don't think that is bad at all. The issue comes in when I have no other means of income apart from going back to work after retirement. Mm. That is where the issue comes in. I, wa I want to take you to a completely different field of endeavor, academia. And I want you to look at the people who are considered to be serious resources. They are old. Mm. That same country that he mentions, mm. 
retirees, you're a president, you're, who, you're put on what you call the lecture circuit. Mm. Yes. People leave commercial in industries, go into politics, go back into industry, enter the lecture circuit. Now, do you know what that then does? You then have a, a country that, or an economy that never loses its skilled manpower. Yes. Uh, it never loses the institutional memory of experience. It's always there and it's always being infused in some of the people who are younger. If you look at a country like Japan, 70-year-olds yeah. in work. Yeah. I, I'm simply saying that there is a Western concept of retirement that worked when we were fewer. Yeah. Resources were plenty. Cost of living was dirt cheap. Mm. So that concept could work. Yeah. But in this modern day and age, take the demographics of even people who earned very good salaries, were able to buy their own houses in town, probably rent them out when they retire, and they go to the rural homes, and ask yourself how they are living. It is a very difficult life for most of those people. Sure. Extremely difficult. And these are not people who didn't plan. These are not people who didn't think ahead. They did all these things. Uh, I think the bigger conversation there should be about uh, the fact that, one, if these people don't retire, the younger people don't get jobs. That is also uh, a factor to consider. And two, I might plan for retirement as myself, but if I don't educate the people around me to plan as well, my children. You know, ma majority of retirees are paying their grandchildren school fees. Mm. Mm -hmm. This basically means that as Linda, as I was empowering myself with the tools and knowledge to save, I did not do that for my children. I did not manage to help them also accumulate something. When they got their first job, I told them, put this aside, let's save for the future. Mm. And by not doing that, now I'm left retired, but still paying school fees. You introduced an interesting discussion. You see, that young people can't get jobs is not the fault of their parents. It's because you have an economy that hasn't grown. Yes. Because if the economy grows, it's able to cater for the large number of people that it produces every year. Because remember, these people, if they enter, whether it's the job market or they create their own jobs, they become taxpayers. Yes. So that country keeps getting money. Now, I'll give you an example of a different country. Mm -hmm. It's called Estonia. Their education system teaches you and insists that as part of your training, you have a business plan. Mm. Secondary school, I'm not talking university. By the time you finish, one of the things that is examined is whether that plan can actually be implemented and whether it can generate money. So by the time someone is leaving Form 4, they have an idea of the sort of business they can do. Yeah. University is the same thing. By the time someone graduates, they probably have a business they're going to run. So if you look at the demographics of Estonia, you are told they have more jobs than they have people. Yeah. Mm. But you see, it is in their education system. There are always jobs because... Almost everyone who goes through the education system thinks of how to create a job. We educate people to think of how to be employed. Yeah. PhDs look for employment. Mm. <laughs> yes. And they should. Yeah. I'm saying PhD, mm. master's, degree. Yeah. Yes. Uh, everyone looks for a job. Yes. Very few uh, job makers. And, and it is how we train our people. Mm. Because somebody has the education but doesn't have the skills. Mm. Agreed, yeah. Yes. Now, skills are something you imbue, something you teach. Now, we got rid of an, uh, these appre apprenticeship systems yes. where you're attached to someone, people who do things so that you actually acquire the skills. Yeah. Now, employers insist they want skills. Where on earth is someone <laughs> going to get those skills yes. if they are never in the workplace? Yeah. Okay? So, again, we have a bloated workforce, potential workforce, who aren't contributing because there is no way for them to plug in. Yeah. Yes. Now, that is what, in my mind, constitutes a total loss. All this money invested. And then, you didn't plan and prepare for them. So, if you're talking about planning, let's have the government. We have a government that actually doesn't plan. I know it sounds like it's being outlandish. It doesn't, because if it planned, this very thing we're talking about would guarantee the government is always making a lot of money from the taxes people pay. Yeah. Because they've invested in ensuring that people can do something that mm. generates money that they, and can grow the economy. Our economy is shrinking mm. right now. It's not growing. Well, what I've learned is you've got to be a cheap monk. You've got to have some nuts you save, some nuts you eat, and some nuts for leisure. Yes. Good. <laughs> well done. The rodents have to come into play. So, look,
even as we talk about we've talked about saving talked about investments mistakes that you make let's look at investment and just a little bit of that uh, in terms of now what the ultimate plan should be as you as you then answer that and talk to us about so looking in what should the plan be what are some um, mistakes not to make or some risks not to take in investments okay um, even as you go into the plan for the year so i would put it this way first uh when you talk about mistakes and talk about risks there are two very different ways to look at them mm -hmm. a mistake no mind when it comes to saving an investment is based on something you did not do mm -hmm. and a risk is something you did but you did not get what you were expecting mm -hmm. So for me, a common mistake will always be not budgeting and not planning for something. That is a common mistake we make. Mm. Another mistake we do is uh, not thinking ahead about things like, I know I've said this a lot, but things like retirement planning or investments or emergency fund, because we live for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We don't think about what will happen then. So that is a common mistake. Uh, right now, if you work for an employer who's fortunate, you're fortunate enough to be giving you a private uh, retirement scheme. Yeah. Most staff, if they were told, do we take this away? You get that money in your salary. They'll say yes. Mm, because to the... them, it's more money. Mm -hmm. Because they're not thinking long term. Mm -hmm. I'm, this money is for my future. This money is, I'm gaining some tax relief from it. My employer is paying for me as well once I pay this. So those are the mistakes people make. Mm. So I believe that is one thing. Uh, not getting insurance, poor, poor budgeting is always, always a big mistake. The risks that people make is not finding out what you're investing in before you invest in it. We have gone through uh, a place where we do something because it worked for someone. Look at the quail farming. Look at mm -hmm. the Uber business. Look at everything. Because I've seen it's working for him, it will definitely work for me. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what backup he has, how much he invested on, or what he knew. So we enter something because it's currently what everyone is doing. That's the major risk we take as Kenyans. Mm -hmm. If I see it's working for them, I'm going to take it. I'll, I'll open this business because it's working mm -hmm. for this other person. That's one of the major risks. Another risk is not doing due diligence in your investment. Always read on any investment before you take. If it's uh, stocks you want to buy, if it's an institution you want to invest in, if it's anything, do not take a risk without seeing how they are run, mm -hmm. seeing who is their regulator, just by simply going to their website, mm -hmm. seeing how it's run, see comments on their pages or on anything. Right. Always make sure you go through that before investing. Okay, so finally, as folks are, we, I mean, all getting to this year, it's clear just from the conversations we've had, the economy is biting, it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, there's not as much shilling as there was before. <laughs> yeah. And here we are saying you can plan. Can you plan properly with a little bit left? Um, and how can you practically do that for the year? So I, w I would always tell someone, start from uh, the basic minimum. Do not think ahead. Most people believe investing is for someone who has a lot of money. Mm. And no, it's not. We, nowadays, we have funds in Kenya that will help you invest for, the, for as little as you have. For example, we have a money market fund at CIC, whereby for a minimum of 5,000 shillings, you are able to open an account. You can top up with 1,000 shillings. And this money earns interest every single day. And it's very liquid. You can get it as and when you please. Mm -hmm. And your principal is guaranteed. You will never ever lose what you put in plus the accumulated interest. Mm -hmm. So that's the first way to start. Start small. As your money accumulates and grows, now you can get into bigger investments, mm -hmm. longer term investments. Find a way to trade in shares. Find a way to buy government bonds or treasury bills alternatively the dollar is currently weakening mm. convert some of your money the into the shilling, the shilling, the shilling sorry is weakening, yes. sorry no, the shilling the is weakening is good. <laughs> 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 the kenya shilling mm. is weakening mm. so this is your chance to convert any money you have into dollars invest it in a dollar money market fund let it earn interest as well as you're waiting because we don't know where we'll end up by the end of the year you do that take that risk invest that money and you will make some money. So there's always somewhere to start. Mm. You don't have to think I need 100,000 to make an investment. No. Mm. For instance, 5,000 shillings you can invest. And let that money work for you. Put money that you won't even think about. Mm -hmm. Let it just be earning interest for you. The day you, the need be, now go for it. 
Great insights to start the year. Happy New Year. Linda Oyaya is the Business Development Manager at CIC Asset Fire uh, Management and we've been talking about financial planning uh, for the new year. I think some things to go away with and also things to remember. Thank you very much for being in the hot seat today. Uh, definitely a lot to learn. Asante Sana. Mark Pichachi, always a good sport. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for Highlight being here. Of my new year. <laughs> <laughs> this is The Situation Room. The only way to start your day.